right, good evening, everybody. Now, believe it or not, I told Eddie when he first came in this evening that I was going to be brief tonight. Uh, and I actually meant that. I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. What I actually hope to do this evening is answer a question for you that for the longest time I was unable to answer for myself. Uh, and I honestly believe it's one that Christians are going to get asked, and typically also, I don't think I'm alone in this, have no clue how to answer the question. So if you haven't been asked this before, this is going to be a good opportunity for you to prepare. Why the Bible? Why do you, as a self-professing Christian, believe in the Bible? Why not some other supposedly inspired book? Why not the Quran? Why not the Pearl of Great Price? Why not the Hindu Vedas? Why not any of these others that claim to be the authority on spiritual matters? Why the Bible? And I touched on this a couple of months back briefly uh, as part of another sermon. And I said I wanted to come back to this at a later date and try to answer this question. Well, this is that date. So, hearing this question, why the Bible? You understand that that is a legit question. Now, we as Christians get defensive about that because, well, you're challenging our Bible. We care about this Bible. We love the Bible. We love the words in it. And it hurts our feelings when somebody questions, why the Bible? Especially from a true apologetics stance. Now, you remember we've talked in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter said there, always be ready to give a defense. That word he used there is apologia, apologetics. Always be ready to give a defense for why you believe what you believe. And I've had this thrown in my face before. Maybe you have as well. Well, this is nothing more than a book written by men. Men are fallible. If men are fallible and this book is written by men, guess what that means then for this book? It too is fallible. And so when Christians are put on the spot on why the Bible, I'm going to give you the two most common answers that they give. And I mean this as loving because I, I was here too. These are the two worst answers you can give. All right. The first one, they'll say, I believe the Bible because it's what I've been taught. That's the first response most give. In fact, that was the response that I typically would give. I believe the Bible because I've been taught that. Please don't use that argument. If that's the statement you make, you've already lost. You've already lost the debate on the authority of the Bible if it's what you believe. Because guess what? The person that was been taught the ways of Joseph Smith and was studied under the Book of the Mormons, for instance, that's what they've been taught since they were little. And by that logic that you're using, it's the authority because it's what you've been taught. Well, so is the Book of the Mormons. It's what they've been taught. And you look back over your childhood, and I don't mean any disrespect to the mothers in here, but just mothers, for instance. Do you remember things that you were taught that you now, as you're older, know are wrong? And the hard lesson you had to learn that your parents weren't perfect? I see, I know, I see the mothers here, but wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Do you remember this, for instance? When you went outside and it was cold, what did your mother always tell you to do? Put a hat on. If you didn't put a hat on, what was going to happen? You're going to catch a cold. Guess what doesn't happen that way? Guess what we learn as we get older? The cold is a virus. Now, we've got nurses in here. I could ask the question, how do you catch a virus? Is it through the top of your head? No. But guess what you were told? You better have a hat on or you're going to catch a cold. We were, we were lied to. <laughs> uh, we weren't lied to. That's just what they were taught. Uh, or I, I would, as a kid, I would always make these faces at my brother. I have a little brother. And uh, I, I'd constantly make faces. My grandmother would say this all the time. Don't do that. Your face is going to get stuck like that. Guess what we know? That doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way, right? And so just because you believe something doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. And to be completely honest with you, 
saying that this, the Bible, is the true Word of God because you believe it is the Word of God is the worst answer you can give. Your belief holds no authority. None. The other most often given answer, which is just as dangerous, just as losing of an argument, is experience. I believe the Bible as the Word of God because I've experienced something in studying the Bible. It changed my life in some way. You experience something. And since you're the only person that's ever experienced something, it has to then be true, right? It has to be true. It has to be life-changing. You see, I remember the first time my grandfather taught me to drive a truck, drive any kind of car. It happened to be the same truck that would eventually be my first vehicle. That was a life-changing experience. I could now drive. Well, guess what? By experience, having authority now means that means that my old 97 Toyota Tacoma is just as much of an authority figure as the Word of God is because I had an experience with it. It changed my life in some form or fashion. It's, it's just as valuable as the Bible is. Do you see how that can be dangerous and how that can be misleading and misguided? But here's the other part that really makes it more dangerous. By this logic alone, Muhammad also has to be correct. Because you see in 610 A.D., Muhammad supposedly has this spiritual experience that led to the ultimate writing and teachings of the Quran. He had an experience. And if experience is all that matters, well then the Quran is just as, as authoritative as the Bible is. Right? So then you might be asking yourself this question, because that's the two most people give, that's the two people turn to, say, well, what then am I supposed to say is the answer to why I believe uh, the Bible is what it is? I hope to answer that question for you tonight. Now, I'll say this in the offset. My, my goal tonight is to help with that question. It's not to defend the Bible itself. Uh, I have this quote. It's been on my computer for some time. I think I used it a long time ago in a sermon. But it was a quote from Charles Spurgeon it said, the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. Let it loose. It'll defend itself. I'm here to answer the question as to why I personally believe the Bible is the word of God. That's my goal. Uh, and what I'm going to use tonight to help answer this, I wish was original with me. I wish I was smart enough to come up with this breakdown from 2 Peter. But I'm not. I don't know where it originated from. I heard it. Believe it or not, I heard this the first time from a Baptist preacher and then study more than I've heard it from several others since then but it actually is a great example of breaking down the text to why we believe the Bible. Uh, it certainly stuck with me. So turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. The good news for you is we'll get to look at this even more in depth in the coming weeks in our Bible study. 2 Peter chapter 1. See Peter is essentially going to answer this same question of why is Scripture the authority? And I, I want to draw off of that and give you four reasons why I believe the Bible. You can use them if you will. You can come up with your own. The only thing I hope you don't do is say, I was taught the Bible, so I believe it. Or I had a feeling, and I believe it. Because those two are not going to help you. So 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Read along with me. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him, from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture of any, is of any private interpretation, 
For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So next time you're asked this question, why do you believe the Bible? Just remember these eight verses and just quote it. There you go. If, you're, if you could do that, there you go. No problem. Amen. We can go home. It answers it better than I could. What I want to do is, uh, you know, for the likes of Eddie, I want to simplify this a little bit and break this down, hopefully, so that you can understand just a few aspects of what it says. So, what he's building this off, the first reason I believe the Bible is it is, it is a collection of historical documents. A collection of historical documents. The Bible does not have a single author. Now, you could say, well, God is the author. Sure, you could always make that claim. The actual pen to paper, the Bible does not have a singular author, but over 40 authors, written over 1,500 years, uh, across three separate continents, in three different languages. That's the Bible. That is what makes up the collection of the Bible. Now, with 40 different authors across 1,500 years, three separate continents, three separate languages, you have a collection of books that carries a singular message. You know what that message is? The redemptive nature of God. Across that many years, that many continents, you have a singular message. Now, the book covers multiple events. It doesn't claim to be a historical book, but it has history. It doesn't claim to be a book of prophecy, but it has prophecy. So it's, it's made up of multiple events. And you know what's so fascinating about this collection of historical documents? Since its creation, because people will make this argument, well, this isn't really inspired by God. This is really a Constantine book at, at the Council of Nicaea. When they put this, they chose what books were going to be where. And it, it's not really uh, books of God. So you think that God in the beginning can say, let there be light, but he can't control what goes into this collection that we have today. So that's how little God is, that he doesn't have that control of what we have. But since the beginning of the Bible, one thing has been a constant People have tried to disprove this book over and over and over again. In fact, uh, some of the best students of the Bible are atheists. They probably put a lot of us to shame in Bible study. Because their sole purpose is trying to disprove it. There's books you can read. I'm trying to remember the name of the author that wrote one where he set out to disprove the book of Acts in Luke's writing and, and by traveling and going to the places that Luke recorded. And he gave his speech to close out the book. He said, if Luke wrote it, I'll believe it. Because everything Luke wrote was found to be historically accurate. But his whole purpose was to disprove it. And so what does Peter start out second figure that we just read by saying? These are not devised fables we're talking about here. These are not made-up stories. You don't start in Genesis 1-1 by saying, Once upon a time in a land far, far away, God said, Let there be light. And there was, you know, none of that stuff happened. That's not how it begins. That's not a, a fable of story. This is truth about the redemptive nature of God. Now, but what you find is this is a common theme in other parts of the Bible. Okay? If you turn to, to Luke, for instance, and you look at how Luke begins his gospel account. He's saying that he's writing to Theophilus. And he said, it seemed good to me to write to you this account so that you have the full story of the things that you were taught. And he said that this is an account, an eyewitness account, the truth, so that you have the whole story. It's not some fable, some made-up thing. It's an orderly account. So let me ask you this question when it comes to this idea that it is a collection of historical documents. If you were a gambling person, now I'm in a room full of Christians, hopefully that's not the case. If you were a gambling person, look at Diana. What do you believe the odds would be that a collection of books would exist like this as long as this book has been around and has yet to be able to be disproven? What are the odds that something like that would happen? Figure in again, 40 authors, 1,500 years, three continents, three languages. What are the odds? Because people will have this aha moment. I, I found a contradiction. And you keep reading. You keep reading. You go, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to find one sooner or later. That's their goal. 
but it hasn't happened yet. See, it's highly unlikely. If that book did exist, that it could be disproven it would already be done so. Now, what I find interesting about ways with this historical document, uh, because I, I want to be careful with that to say that. I don't want to say this. It's, it's book. No, it's a historical document. So with this historical document, you know that there have been over 25,000 archaeological digs that have taken place based upon the Bible. You know what one of them is yet to do? Disprove the Bible. Now, several of them have actually helped prove the authority of the Bible and what's taken place. But 25,000, that's the number of 25,000 have set out to either disprove this, to see if it holds any kind of merit, and it either proves it or is unable to disprove it. One of the two. The Bible predates science. You can read in the Bible about the solar system. And that is the sun that pulls the galaxy. What, what is that talking about? That's the sun that pulls all of this in. That's, the, that's, that's the, uh, the cycle of the solar system that it rotates around the sun. How could the Bible know that before the science did? How could the Bible know anything about science and healing practices, the water cycle, how water evaporates the clouds and it rains? How could the Bible know that centuries before we, as you know, these, these smart beings, could figure any of that out? How could that be possible? Well, it's a collection of historical documents that is inspired by the Word of God. That is inspired by God Himself. So it predates our understanding. So the second reason, I've already touched on it here a little bit, why I believe the Bible, is that it is written by eyewitness accounts or someone that was a firsthand to an eyewitness account. That would be Luke, for instance. Luke wasn't an eyewitness uh, that's why a lot of his writings are, are pulled from Peter or from Mary. They're either eyewitnesses to what's taken place, as, as Peter's writing is, of course. John, I'm going to look at a passage from John here in a second. Or had first-hand knowledge of an eyewitness account. So, 1 John, when, it, when John, when he begins his letter in 1 John, I want you to listen to how he, he documents this. 1 John chapter 1, he begins that letter by saying, That which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, that our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Guess what the word of life is? The gospel. And now you said, well, we've heard it, we've seen it, we've held it. We've seen, we bear witness, we declare to you that eternal life, which are from the Father, was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. So they've seen it, they've heard it, they've touched it. Guess what it doesn't say? We had, we had a, a singular vision. No, that's Muhammad. Uh, we, we, we had an angel visit us and we were taught this. No, no, now we're getting into Smithian type teaching. So it doesn't say any of that. What it says is they were firsthand eyewitnesses. So we have in this collection people that actually saw it happen. People that actually heard the words of God speak. People that saw the miracles and were visibly filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what Peter just wrote in his section, in 2 Peter verse chapter 1. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So not only is it a book, a, a collection of historical documents, it is a collection of documents written by first-hand eyewitnesses. You see how in-depth we can go with this to not just say it's a feeling I have, it's something I was taught? We, we're going to keep going. And I want to ask you this question. Being a first-hand eyewitness. Well, Tyler here, so it's even more fun to do that. So if, if Tyler gets called into a court case, and I imagine he's, I'm sure he has been before, and he says, well, uh, well, Tyler, if you saw this, uh, explain to us w what you saw firsthand. Well, I wasn't really there. You know, I was told about it after the fact. What's the judge going to say? How's that going to go? What? Out. You're of no use. You have second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand information. It's not a reliable source. Now, if he comes to Tyler, he says, Tyler, were you there? He says, I was there. I witnessed it. I saw it. I heard it. What does that then mean? Well, that's a good account. You're an eyewitness to it. So, if you're going to believe a document that's written by somebody that you have no eyewitness account, 
you're now just kind of on a hope and a prayer. That's not what we have. We have eyewitnesses, uh, eyewitness accounts. And I want to give you some examples. How many people saw the miracles of Jesus, for instance? They will, he fed the 5,000. There's a big number at one time. But just, you know, throw out 10,000 people maybe saw miracles. Because he didn't only feed them one. He didn't feed one time 5,000. So figure 10,000 people saw miracles still. They're eyewitness accounts of the miracles of Jesus. Now, the greatest miracle that ever took place was the fact that on a Friday, Jesus Christ was killed, from, taken off the cross, put in a grave, and Sunday he arose. Greatest miracle that ever took place. Now, do you know what happened following that event? Over 500 people saw the resurrected Lord. You say, okay, well, that's great. Well, I'm going to add to that when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, he documents those that were visited by the resurrected Lord, those that saw him. Now, what's so ironic and interesting about that is by the time Paul writes that, at least 300 of these people are still alive. So if Paul is writing this, that, well, you know, 500 people saw the resurrected Lord, 300 of them are alive. If it wasn't true, what would they say? That didn't happen. I didn't see the Lord resurrected. You know what you don't have? You don't have anybody saying, that's not true. See, that's a statement that could be falsified. That's a statement that you could tell and no one could say it. When Jesus held, when he, he healed the paralytic, what did he say? It's easy for me to say, your sins are forgiven. Who can verify? But if I say, get up and walk, and you get up and walk, that's proof. So, by Paul saying, well, 500 people saw him, if they're all dead and gone, who can say, I don't know, okay, sure. I have no way to prove that is either true or not. He makes that statement while they're still alive. That could be disproven very easily. But you don't have that. It wasn't disproven. Not only was it just Paul, it was, wasn't just one or two or twelve. It was hundreds of people that say this. And again, it never fails. They're going to say this is a book written by men. Men are, are fallis, uh, fallible. It's filled with inaccuracies. None can ever be found. It's written by first-hand eyewitnesses. Now, I'm going to put a little caveat to this. I didn't, I didn't draw this out. I, don't, I don't, didn't want to take time to really draw this out much here. What's the other claim you hear when it comes to the writings of men? Translations. Oh, you're reading the translation of a translation of a translation. You're not reading the original thing. You're not doing this. Well, if that's the argument, you're going to hold trail. You better throw out every book you've got that you claim to be a historical document. You go back and you look at some of the earliest translations, you're back to just decades after the close of the canons of the Bible. And people are saying, well, it's like the game of telephone. If I tell Tyler something and then Tyler's going to rewrite it, he's going to tell Beverly, Beverly's going to tell Will, Will's going to tell Beverly. And by the time you get all the way down to her, what I told Tyler is not the same. That's dumb logic. You're assuming that the translation that I'm reading came from the translation that Tyler's reading, that came from the translation that Beverly's reading. That's not the case. When you go back and you look at the earliest trans, uh, uh, translations, you're back to decades after the, the close of the canons of the Bible, people aren't saying, okay, well, I've got this translation, now I'm going to make my copy off of this. No. When they're translating the Bible to different languages, they're going back as far as they can to the most original they can get to. We don't have original documents. The paper they were written on, the, the papyrus, all this stuff, we don't have any of that stuff. We have old documents, and then when it's being translated, they're going back to some of the 6,000 earliest translations and pulling from there. So what you have, in a sense, is I'm giving a translation to Tyler. I'm giving a translation to Beverly. I'm giving a translation to Will, to Bethany. So guess what you have if you ask Tyler a question or you ask Bethany a question? You should have the same answer because it came from the same source. To say it's a translation issue is just... Dumb argument. That's a desperation move to again try to disprove the Bible. So I didn't even want to draw it out. It's not even worth the time. The third reason why I believe the Bible is it describes supernatural events that carries weight around the world. You talk about Mount Transfiguration. Well, Peter talks about that here. You talk about Jesus walking on water. Uh, again, don't, tell, don't forget the fact that Jesus was dead on Friday and alive on a Sunday. Don't miss that either. 
But you, you look at the worldwide sense of things, okay? How is it possible that we in the U.S. have a flood story? That's what it's called. The Noah's Ark is a flood story. But you go to some tribe in the Middle East, and guess what they have? They have a flood story. This great flood story. And it's that way all around the world with, with tribes, with peoples that should have no way of having this information. How do they have the same story that we have? How is that possible? Unless it had been passed down generation to generation. Why do we have writings that talk about the destruction of the Egyptian army, oh, by the way, in a sea? Well, we have it because they were dumb enough to chase Moses into the sea that was tried to die. Why do we have things like this, of these supernatural type things? And again, I told you, there's, there's 25,000 digs so far have been set to disprove the Bible. And it's amazing how many of them will come back and point to something like this. You say, well, I don't know how that could be the case. Well, if this wasn't the book, the Word of God, it couldn't be the case. You'd have no way of knowing it or proving it. I'm going to speed up a little bit. The fourth reason is the, pro the prophetic sense of the book. See, I believe the Bible is the Word of God because of the amount of prophecies fulfilled within it. You look at the last few verses of 2 Peter. It says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is ever of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Do you know that to this day, King Cyrus still blows my mind? It does. It, it still blows my mind. That alone, in my opinion, is no way... There's no way you can justify that knowledge without it being prophetic. How is it that King Cyrus, 150 years before he's born, is named by name as the king who is going to allow the, the Jews to return from captivity? 150 years before that ever takes place. How could that happen? Well, let's back up. That, that's easy. That's 150 years. Or maybe, maybe it was luck. Maybe, maybe somebody just, just got it right. I don't know. That's not that far. 150 years. That's older than any of us. What about 700 years? You turn to Isaiah 53. You start reading 700 years. Here's Isaiah prophesying about the birth of Christ, the, the suffering Messiah. All of these things. How could Isaiah know any of this 700 years prior to Christ coming? Well, again, okay, let, let's, let's keep it in context, all right? That's 700 years. Maybe they got lucky. 700 years. Let's back it up to 1,000 years. Let's make it a little more challenging. You turn to Psalm 22, and you find the prophetic sense of Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross. That his hands and his feet will be pierced. That didn't happen on all crucifixions. Just so you, just so, if you didn't know that, not everybody that was placed on the cross had their heads and their feet pierced. Some were just tied around the wrist. But here's the kicker. It's going to be nailed to a tree. You know what wasn't even a thing by the time Psalm 22 was written? Crucifixion. He's writing about something that doesn't even exist yet. People weren't crucified until much later on in history, starting with the Persians, perfected by the Romans. You're centuries down the line. Yet a thousand years before Christ, here they are saying that he is going to be pierced and he's going to be nailed to a cross. How in the world could the psalmist know that? But you believe the Bible because you were taught that. You believe the Bible because it was a feeling, an experience. See, I believe the Bible because it's a collection of historical documents written by first-hand eyewitnesses that describe supernatural events with multiple prophecies fulfilled over time that cannot be explained any other way. I believe a book written by men. Men couldn't write this book. 
Ben couldn't write this book if they weren't inspired, if they weren't there to see it, to experience it themselves. That's why I believe the Bible. But here's the thing. Like I said in the very beginning, most Christians don't know how to answer that question. Now, I don't expect you to, to quote my answer. Like I said, my answer is derived from an answer somebody else gave that I liked. And uh, I've, I've been thinking about this answer all week from 2 Peter chapter 1. And so this is my answer. I've got a guy that I have this conversation with a lot. And this is the answer I now give. And it's funny to see his response when I give that answer. Because I've, I've, I've given people an answer before. Well, I've been taught that. Oh, you've been taught that. Okay. Well, since you've been taught that, that's fine. But let me tell you some other things that you've probably been taught that are wrong. But when you say that, well, Justin, why do you believe the Bible? Because it's a collection of historical documents written by firsthand eyewitnesses that describe supernatural events and the fulfillment of prophecy over a thousand years before they came true. The, the facial expression you get in return is almost priceless. They're like, oh, huh, okay. And normally the conversation gets changed. Because now you've got to refute first-hand accounts. And if you try to refute that, then you've got to refute every other historical document you want to hold to. And so then the, the argument starts to crumble in and of itself for the people that want to argue that. So I want to ask you this question in closing. I told you I was going, well, that was kind of short. Kind of short and sweet. Why do you believe the Bible? You Christian, you're asked tomorrow, why do you believe the Bible? Do you have an answer to give? Outside of, I was taught this. I, I feel this. Could you give an answer? The majority of Christians cannot. And so when they start trying to defend the Bible, defend why they believe in the Bible, they do more harm than good. Because here you are, as a person that believes it, and you don't know why you believe what it even is. You see the slope that you can get on? So why do you believe the Bible? Well, do you know why most people don't want to believe the Bible? If you believe that this is the Word of God, guess now what that means. You've got to live by what it says. Or admit the reality that you're not going to live by what it says, and therefore what it says is coming to those that don't live by it is going to come to you. If you believe it's the Word of God, then you have to treat it as the authority of such, which means your life is going to be different. People don't want that. So you have 25,000 archaeological digs. You have atheists after atheists trying to disprove the Bible. All these things taking place for the hope, the single hope, that they don't have to listen to it. So again, why do you as a Christian believe the Bible? I hope that's something you can answer. I'd be glad to study with you more on it if you'd like. Uh, or if you need help in, in formulating your answer. It's your answer, but I'd be glad to help you in any way I can. Levi's going to lead us in an invitation song here in just a moment. Um, and I would be remiss, even though this was more of a uh, study of the Bible itself, more than a, a, a sincere sermon of the Bible itself. I'd still be remiss not to at least offer the invitation for anyone that might be in need this night. As Levi leads us in this invitation song, if we can do anything for you, if we can pray for you, uh, if you're not a Christian and you're ready to accept the gospel call, uh, we'd love to help you in that as Levi leads us in this invitation song.